Welcome to Future Foodcast. I'm Pam Line Miller, your host. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you to our sponsor, Farm to Plate. They are creating tomorrow's food business ecosystem today. You can find out more at farmtoplate.io. Today's guest is from Kay He, and I'm so excited to have her on talking all about sustainability. Her name is Laura McCord, and she is the Executive Director of Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility at Kay He. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to hear all the great information you have to share with with us. Uh, first of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about Kehi and what they do? Kehi is a nat national natural specialty and fresh food distributor across the United States. We serve retailers such as like Publix, Kroger, now with our DPI acquisition, Albertson Safeway, as well as thousands of independent grocers across the U.S. Okay. That's a lot, a lot happening there. Lots of retailers and that's, that's a big business. So we're really excited to have you unpack what's what's happening over there in the area of sustainability and corporate responsibility. What do you do? <laughs> That's the big question. <laughs> so I wear a couple of different hats. So part of my job is sustainability. I also do supplier diversity, as well as I manage our B Corp certification. Okay. Um, maybe we can take them one at a time. Sure. And you can share a little bit about each of those. Um, you started out with sustainability, and I know there's a lot going on in the area of sustainability these days. There is. So I work really closely with our operations team and our transportation team. We tend to look at sustainability in our four main buckets. So waste, including food waste, transportation, energy, and refrigerant management. That is where our greatest footprint is, not including you know cost of goods. So that's where we're focused on. How do we reduce our emissions in those areas and be more sustainable? Yeah. And so what kind of initiatives do you have in those four areas that you're trying to make an impact? With waste, we're trying to increase our recycling, reducing the amount of product going into landfills. Food waste obviously is very important to us as a food distributor. So looking at different ways where we can buy better, where we can manage our inventory at the warehouses, making sure that we're getting the right products to the right retailers at the right time. So they have enough time to sell the products as well. And then for electricity, it's reducing our consumption. So finding alternatives, increasing like LED lighting or reducing our energy consumption. Transportation is always an interesting one because we drive 40 million miles and we can't just flip a switch and go to electric, right? Um, and there's pros and cons with, with every alternative that is out there. So we're always looking at little things that we can do to increase our miles per gallon. We also, one of the big initiatives that we've done that we're pretty excited about is shore power. So normally with a reefer truck, you're using diesel to cool down the reefer before you load in your refrigerated and frozen products. So instead we plug that into our warehouse. So it's going off of the electric grid and it's actually saving like over a million, million and a half pounds of greenhouse gas emissions from going into the atmosphere. So that's a pretty exciting wow. project for us that we've started rolling out to more and more of our warehouses. That's amazing. You know, in the food waste area, I guess, since you're dealing in the fresh foods, a lot of those code dates, like you're trying to think ahead and, and strategize on the movement of the food in a, an efficient and timely manner. So all that, that ordering, you mentioned inventory, making sure you're levels are correct. There's a lot of moving parts to that piece of it. There is, especially if, I mean, the further you can go upstream, the better. So we have to know what our retailers think they're going to move. Then we have to look at buying it right. So the producers are producing just the right amount of product as well. So there are a lot of moving parts. Then with all the different retailers we work with, somebody might be having a sale one week, somebody else isn't. Maybe when you put yogurt of brand A on sale, brand B declines a little bit. So oh. it's a fine balancing act and it's really tough for our supply chain, but they do a great job. Well, yeah, that, I can just imagine there's a lot in there and the communication piece, you know, across uh, is really important. And is that a lot manual or do you have like technology or digital platforms that you're trying to work with 
with all these different retailers. I can imagine that's another. Yeah, we definitely are using our technology (laughs) to help us along with that. Um, So as great as our forecasting systems are, we do have to rely on our retailers to sharing that information with our account managers who then share it with our supply chain partners, who then share it with our brands. So there is a little bit of that um, manual communication and planning and strategy. Um, It's really everybody's job. If you really want to tackle food waste, it's it's got to be the consumer demand to the retailer, to the distributor, to the manufacturer. Yes, that's absolutely a big thing. And I really love what you were talking about with the trucks because your impact is so large and the miles that you drive are so many that when you can just even make some incremental changes, that's a very large impact. And um, I, I like to see large companies doing things like that, because then I think the smaller companies just see your lead and say, oh, well, maybe this is something that we might be able to consider doing as well. And you kind of set the trend there for what areas to begin looking in, because it's hard to know what what the right answers are in sustainability. I mean, this is your job all the time, but that's what I'm hearing from those that I interview on Future Foodcast. We have all kinds of ideas out there, but try to identify what's going to actually last as the ideas get vetted and we figure Mm -hmm. out where the best value um, for our time and our money, where we're going to get the best return on investment is going to be, uh, we don't know all those answers yet. Well, I think that's, what's really great about our transportation team is they're always piloting something, (laughs) any little small tweak that we can make in miles per gallon. I was doing the math ahead of time. So if we just improved from 7.25 miles per gallon to 7.5 miles per gallon, does not sound like a lot. That's 4 million pounds of greenhouse gas emissions avoided just by making that small increase in miles per gallon. So you're talking about 0.3 miles per gallon increase return. Can you say that number again? Four million pounds. That's amazing. Yeah. And just to play off of what you were saying before, there is no silver bullet. There are so many different levers in so many different aspects, whether it's the consumer, the business, doesn't matter. If everybody just starts pulling a lever, we will have a cumulative change. But if we're waiting for that silver bullet, it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen in time. So continue to Mm -hmm. investigate and try, see what works. And then when you find that it works like shore power, then scale it. Yeah. I think that's really great advice for those who are listening to us who might be in a position where they own a company or are involved in logistics or have a food waste situation that they can improve on, maybe some of Laura's words of wisdom can help you figure out how you can reduce your impact in those areas and really make a difference. Because I, I agree with you, Laura, I think it's the collective of everybody doing a little bit. You know, we we talk about that at the consumer level. I I know for me, recycling is where I think about it because I, everybody's not a recycler out there and I'm a big recycler. And it's to the point where if somebody gives me a water bottle I, and I don't have anywhere to throw it away, that's going to be a recyclable solution. You know, it's just a regular trash can. I'll actually bring it home with me so that I can recycle it. Uh, but I think if we as individuals thought that way, just like the companies are starting to think, you know, in the collective, we can all really, in our own little way, it adds up to be such a cumulative. Absolutely agree with you. I think it's really positive. Um, So let's talk about some of the other areas. So you've got the sustainability, you have Mm -hmm. the corporate responsibility. Sure. Um, We could talk about B Corp. We've been certified since 2015. Oh, that was early, I would say. Yes. And we just completed our next round of the recertification process and very excited to say that we have improved our score 30% since our initial (gasps) certification. So very excited about that. That Uh, is huge. Yeah. (laughs) That's huge. That's a lot. B Corp really helps set the standard. And, you know, every year, if you work that plan, you can make improvements to make your business better for all stakeholders. Yep. Can you, for our listeners who aren't familiar, there's a lot involved in that B Corp status, that certification and all that you need to do. Can you break down some of those components for them? 
Yeah. So it's divided into governance, workers, community, environment, and customers. And each one of those sections has a certain number of points available to them. And each question underneath each of those sections is worth a different amount of points. So you take the test and it's about 300 questions you go through the audit process and they pretty much audit you on everything. So you have to have all of the backup um, and proof for why you answered the way that you answered. And then at the end of the day, as long as you score at least a minimum of 80 points, you can get certified. So when we initially certified, we were around 84 points and now we're, we're closer to 109 points. That's fabulous. Congratulations. That does not come without a lot of focus, effort, investment, everybody's working towards the goals. Absolutely. It's really a a foundation for who we are. It's a certification. Mm -hmm. I like to say it's one thing to be organic. It's another to be certified organic. It's one thing to say we're a great company and we really believe in our values and that we're a great place to work. It's another for a third party to validate that and say, yeah, they actually are a pretty good place to work. It is a really big deal. And Laura, in the sustainability area in particular, I mean, there are, All of the certifications, or I should say um, checks and balances, I I think there are a lot of companies out there who want to say they're sustainable, and maybe they are saying they're sustainable, but we don't really know what that means. Like, There's not all the checks and balances out there to verify the verification process, to verify that uh, a lot of these claims that some companies are making are actually, not that they'd be lying, but just that they're doing what they say they're doing to the extent that they say they're doing it. Uh, And the nice thing about the B Corp, it's data-based and checked and verified. And you know that a company with the certification, you know, is living up to the standards. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing. Uh, What other programs do you have happening there at KHE? We have a couple of supplier programs. We sell obviously other people's branded products and and we group them into four areas. We have Elevate, which is for new products, new and emerging products. We have Care Trade, which is our focus on mission-based brands. Diverse Trade, which is focused on our diverse supplier owners. And then EcoTrade, those brands that are really setting the bar high with like a science-based target or uh, climate neutral certification. So it's just a way for us to make it a little bit easier for our retailers to find the brands that the consumers are looking for. Okay. And do they put themselves in a category or do you evaluate the companies? And that's a great question. That so it depends on the, on the program. So for okay. eco trade, they have to have a certification. So like you said, it is hard to is this brand really doing what they say they're going to do? And, Mm -hmm. and does it really cover the scope and magnitude of, you know, what's going on out there? So they have to have a science-based target or be certified for that. For diverse trade, they do have to be certified as a diverse owned company. And there's different certifiers that do that, like WeBank for women owned or NMSDC for minority owned. We also look at veteran, LGBTQ+, uh, people with disabilities. Anybody that has that certification can enter that program. But for the mission-based one, that's an application process. So we only select five brands to focus on, um, five new brands, I should say, each year. So we'll have a total of 10 brands in that program on an annual basis. Okay. So you add on like each year, you could have five new ones that you're yep. putting into the program. Yep. Do, does it only last a couple of years? So you two years. are moving them through two years. Okay. Yep. All right. So you're helping them navigate the distribution world. It's crazy. You go food shopping and you just pick up your box of mac and cheese and you're not really thinking much about how they got onto the shelf or how they stay onto the shelf or how they met with the retailer, how they met with the distributor. There's so much that goes into it. So we're just trying to help them navigate this crazy food world that we're in uh, and be successful because we really want Their success means more money goes to their philanthropic activities, which supports our philanthropic activities of serving to make lives better. So, exactly. I think it's funny that you uh, mentioned that because it it is like a a whole network uh, out there just trying to get your your product out there. And 
for our listeners and viewers, they've heard me say this before with other guests, but before the pandemic, I think the average citizen of the world didn't really, if they heard the word supply chain, they maybe knew about it, but they didn't care about it or need to know about it. But after the pandemic, when they were directly affected by challenges in the supply chain in all different areas, like you said, then they started to pay attention. How does my mac and cheese get on the shelf? How are my vegetables and fruits getting sourced and to the supermarket where I'm buying them? And I think a lot of us are a lot more aware of the supply chain than we ever intended to be. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing, but like I you think said, it's a there, great there's thing. a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it brings a little bit of compassion to the, to the situation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, then in the logistics area, we talked about the trucking and how you can make some changes just in the way you're cooling the trucks. And I imagine some routing decisions can also, all of, all that goes into logistics, you know, the timing and uh, the routing decisions that are made, all of that can affect the energy that you're using. And the, like you said, maybe try to minimize the miles you're driving or the impact those miles are having by having different energy sources. Absolutely. So yeah. us opening up new warehouses, even that ah. really happens because we're trying to get closer to the retailers to reduce okay. the miles that are driven. Okay. We're always looking out route optimization. We're also mm -hmm. looking at how many deliveries does a store really need? I know a store would love to get serviced five days a week, but if you're ordering unique items on all five of those, well, maybe you could have gone to one or two and that reduces the miles driven. So again, if we're looking at it collaboratively with our retail partners, collaboratively with our supply chain, you know, we can really make an impact as an industry to reduce our, yeah. you know, combined carbon footprint. Yeah. And, and that word collaboration is really important, especially in the food supply chain. I think that uh, so many times companies are staying siloed, but Kehi is bringing people together because you're, you're a connector. Yeah, you know, you're bringing the products in and warehousing them, fulfilling orders, and and you're working on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, so you're in a unique position to be able to maybe help people make better decisions <laughs> on both sides. We could try to influence it for sure. <laughs> there we go, influence. I know some people are not going to move and and maybe have yep. their own ideas. Uh, <laughs> what other areas would you like to share with our audience that you're involved with, Laura? Um, I would say maybe if we go back to sustainability with refrigerants, it's something that's okay. not really talked a lot about, um, because it's really just looking at the escaped refrigerants, but the global warming potential of the refrigerants is significant. It's, it's a lot worse than, you know, carbon dioxide, which we are focused on. It just doesn't stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years. It's more like a hundred years or something. So looking at ways to reduce your refrigerants. And managing your refrigerants, I think is really important if you have retailers that are listening or even brands, how we can help manage that. So we've been investing in all lower global warming potential refrigerants in our new builds, which in some cases have like an 84% reduction in GWP. So that's pretty significant. And we don't talk about it that much. You are, so GWP is global warming potential. Yep. Uh, and for... That's a huge number. You you mm -hmm. keep throwing out these big numbers, Laura. That I hope our audience, like me, is going, wait, what? <laughs> did you yeah. say 84%? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> I did. I did. So again, it's all these levers that we can pull mm -hmm. that will make a cumulative difference. Okay. Wow. I, I'm just excited that Kehi is so focused on some of these initiatives and, and the impact that you're making. Um, and we've talked about, you know, in a short amount of time here on the podcast, or we have talked about a lot of different opportunities and a lot of them that you are diving into and investigating, making investments in as well, because you're changing your impact and, and for the better, and hopefully mm -hmm. other people can take the lead uh, is what else would you like to share with us? Is there anything else before we go? Um, I would just say that at Kehi. We have this slogan, we serve to make lives better. And for mm -hmm. us, environmental stewardship means 
part of that, right? If we save all the people that we want, but they don't have clean water, clean air, we haven't helped them. So we have to be good stewards of the environment in order to continue to serve, to make lives better. So it's just important to us as an organization. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this really important message. I know that our listenership is very interested in the topics that you covered today, Laura, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Audience, if you liked uh, this interview with Laura and would like to hear more on the topics of sustainability, some of the things that Laura spoke about, please leave us some comments and let us know if there are other areas you want to hear about. We would like to know that too. Until next time, I'm Pam Line Miller.